Well, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to present to you Professor Devin Shah. He is the Mayor Bascom Professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. He is also the Director of the Mass Communication Research Center, Research Director of the Center for Communication and Civil Renewal, and Scientific Director in the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies. He has an abiding interest in the intersecting power of framing and the social capital, has shaped his, uh, his research uh, on the influence of message construction and processing, the communication dynamics shaping civic participation, and the effects of computer and mediated interactions on chronic disease management. I think for a lot of um, postgraduate students and PhD students who are here, uh, many of you assigned readings this semester <laughs> is from him. So it's really, really a great pleasure to have him today. And as you, many of you are familiar with that he often applies computational approaches to social science uh, questions. And like your readings uh, about his uh, foreign studies. And also he is now applying the machine learning and multimodal classification to study communication in politics and health. So without further ado, I'll just uh, give the floor to Professor Shah. Very nice introduction. Uh, a, a pleasure to be with all of you today. I will take the screen. The talk today is titled Digital Traces and Social Ties, How Computational Social Science is Transform Transforming Communication Research. And knowing the kind of research that takes place at, uh, at, at Hong Kong Baptist and, 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 and Hong Kong in general, and among the very sophisticated scholars that make up more broadly, uh, 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 you know, uh, scholars working within the broader Asian uh, communication system, and then more broadly in ICA, um, none of this is going to come as news to you. Many of you are already applying computational methods in different ways. Many of you are thinking about how to examine all the ways that we behave in the digital world in varied approaches, everything from interviews and ethnography and digital ethnography to looking at digital trace data, looking at network ties, uh, 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 looking at deeper interactions. And so the talk I want to give today, again, um, you know, it's uh, 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 really a talk that, again, I think you saw the abstract, but really it's about the exponential growth in the volume, velocity, and variability of structured and unstructured social data, and how that creates certain unique challenges for us as communication scholars. The question I'm going to pose to you, and I'm going to try to answer, really by looking across two different lines of research that we've conducted, I'm going to share in the process of the talk probably eight or 10 different studies that we've done, but just kind of going through them quite quickly to give you a sense of the scope of the project work. And underlying this, I think, is the question of how can scientists best use computational tools to analyze this huge volume, velocity, and variability of data with the goal of understanding individuals and their interactions within social systems. And I think we are in a golden age of communication and communication research. Um, communication, if you look at journal citation reports, if you look at uh, 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 kind of average rates of citation to communication journals, we now exceed sociology, we now exceed political science. Um, we're at the center of many conversations. Um, we're closing quickly on psychology in terms of the standing of our journals and their impact. That's a remarkable change in a period of, you know, 10 to 15 years. And I think that really speaks to, again, uh, the kinds of methods and questions and the ways that we've been thinking about already, regardless of the methods of understanding individuals and their interactions. But what I think computational social science and specifically as a way of looking within things like social media interactions provides us is an unprecedented view into expression, actions, connections, things like contagion, imitation. Um, these are all forms that are frankly quite easily traceable in ways that, I mean, Gabriel Tart in the you know uh, uh, turn of the previous century was writing about the laws of imitation and how you know some people imitated others and how fads spread and and 
he was talking about this in the 1900s. We can see and measure and examine that now with great exactitude. At the same time, our ability to do this is plagued by issues of data privacy. We know there's examples of people being manipulated without fully informed consent, sometimes by large social media companies, and sometimes with scholars working with large social media companies in ways that has raised alarm. Um, there's also the harvesting of deep user profile data. And we saw this from everything from Cambridge Analytica to lots of other ways of trying to identify de-identified data. All of these start to push us up against, well, just because we can do certain kinds of research, should we? And what are the limits and the ethics of our, our attention to the use of computational methods when looking at this unprecedented access into all of these behaviors, all of these utterances, actions by people in social spaces. There's also an issue of data representativeness. We need to recognize that the people who operate in those social spaces online are not like the rest of us. And they're not, and the interactions are not a reflection of necessarily day-to-day -day interactions that they are specific sometimes to the social media world. And we just finished a book called Battleground where we looked at interviews and conventional discourses face-to-face. -face. We looked at online discourses and we looked at news media and we looked at them kind of side by side. And there's huge differences, of course. What is happening in conversation face-to-face -face is not what we can see in social media. The people who use social media are not like everybody else as a cross section of people in the world, right? This is a very unique slice. It doesn't mean it's not meaningful. I think it's deeply meaningful and I think it gives us a great potential insight, but we have to be aware of what it is providing us. <laughs> the term I'd like to advance, and this is a term that uh, uh, myself and Joe Capella and Russ Newman used when we uh, did a collected volume in the Annals of the American Academy of Political social science on computational communication science. And we kind of, we, we hinted at the term big data, but we, we frankly largely poo-pooed it and, and said in the piece that we didn't think big data was a very adequate way of talking about what really was a change we were seeing. And in, in the collection of, of articles that we have in that special issue, I think lay out really this broader view of what computational communication science is. And in our mind, it's data collections and analytic techniques that generate or utilize large complex data databases. They don't need to be necessarily big data. It doesn't need to be huge. It might be, but it doesn't need to be. It typically involves computing variables from trace data available from digital mobile or social media and using machine or algorithmic solutions to generate patterns or inferences from these data. How much does this overlap with already established modes of doing quantitative research? A great deal. And many people can move freely between those two modes. And oftentimes we connect data we've used using more conventional social science techniques with computational techniques. For example, using hand-coded data about candidates' behaviors during debates and linking it to the volume and variability of social media data on a second-by-second -second basis. What's happening on the screen? What's happening in the social media environment as candidates say or do things or gesture or grimace or point? I mean, it's a set of questions we can now answer. Really what we're talking about is computational analysis of digital trace data, the social media expression and interaction, social network ties and community membership, and geolocation, and especially increasingly sensor data. And I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that in this talk, which is, look, when we talk about computational social science, I think we first think about things like text analytics and looking at digital uh, 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 expression and, uh, or looking at news media content using various kinds of computational text analysis tools, or even machine learning built classifiers for different categories of language. We also think, I think, 
very quickly about social network ties and network analysis and network analytics and different network matrices and different network indices. And more broadly, I think there's an established and I think important literature on the notion of online communities that people have established. I think less so have we as a field thought about things like geolocation and sensor data that mobile devices provide and can provide very important data, sometimes if contextualized with other forms, which I'll talk about. All of these forms offer the potential for multi-method multi triangulation, and we often use them in concert with experiments, surveys, dissemination studies, clinical trials. It's not one or the other. It's not, oh, I think this approach is the best. I think it's one of many tools you need in your toolkit. And as a social scientist, especially a communication scientist, you need to use multiple tools because we're looking at complex phenomena and we're not a, a one level field. If we're in psychology, you really need to learn how to use experiments though. They're doing a tremendous amount of computational work in psychology too. You know, And so again, as a discipline that crosses different levels of analysis, I think understanding the use of different methods that cross those levels is critically important. So I wanna talk about two cases that kind of illustrate this idea. One is uh, really around social network sites and health support. And this is research we've been doing around the comprehensive health enhancement support system, which is essentially a social networking and social support system that's been developed at Wisconsin in a center uh, uh, that is the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies. I'm the scientific director in that center. And it is a center that has been very successful at getting large federal grants. I think in total, they've probably generated around three to $400 million in grants. I've been involved with Dave Gustafson, who's the director of the center, probably in about 50 million in federal grants. It's really about building technology for social support of people who are in chronic care settings. That chronic care setting could be addiction treatment. That chronic care setting could be, um, uh, 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 it could be uh, um, uh, aging uh, or the need to age in place. It could be asthma care. It could be age HIV support. And we've done projects on all of those. <clears throat> the project I wanna to talk to you about is really centered around the opioid epidemic in the United States. Um, opioids in the US are a, scourge. I mean, they are literally, um, you know, one of the most serious problems. The research that we did began with research on drinking and excessive drinking. And in the U.S., excessive drinking is also a humongous problem and a serious social problem in terms of 80,000 deaths per year, tremendous amounts of violence and injuries, both domestic violence, motor vehicle crashes, other kinds of injuries, various risky sexual behaviors can lead to chronic conditions. It's a quarter of a trillion dollars in economic cost within the US economic system. This is a huge problem. But opioids are potentially even a bigger problem. In one year, 2019, and this number has gone up in 2020 and 2021, 70,000 people died from drug overdoses related to opioids. 1.6 million are thought to have an opioid use disorder. 1.6 are misusing prescription pain relievers for the first time. It's, it's a huge problem in terms of deaths. It's a huge problem in terms of work loss. It's a huge problem just in terms of health and well-being. What we've done at Wisconsin and at CHESS is developed a computer-based system that integrates a range of services through the smartphone that lets people receive information, different ways of communicating and connecting, and different tools that support relapse prevention. So on the screen, you're seeing some of these. 
there's things like my messages, one-to-one -one communication with different people in your network who you may trust. It could be a program manager, could be a therapeutic support, could be a friend you've made on the system. There's also a team feed where we can send out group messages. There's the support team where you can reach out to different support team members and discussion boards where you can post messages to the full group and interact in those ways. There's a link to different relapse prevention meetings, 12-step meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. There's a panic button where people can literally push the button and be directly connected with therapeutic support. There's sober events that you can go to. There's recovery info and new news. There's stories people have shared about their recovery and ways that they've stayed sober. And then podcasts, if you'd rather listen to someone. And then there's also things like easing distress, mindfulness meditation. And we have surveys, ecological momentary assessment, that's part of the system where we may ask people at various points to complete a survey response. So this person has an uncompleted survey response. So they have a little triangle showing. They have one message that they haven't read. So that's showing them what they, uh, 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 how they can interact in the system. The research that I'm gonna to talk to you about is based on a series of past studies that have already completed and already been kind of uh, 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 reported in clinical trial findings or in implementation study findings. Um, these are large federal studies funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, really around a variety of questions. One, uh, implementing technology-assisted drug treatment, so really about combining drug treatment with um, uh, 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 this system to say, if you're doing medication-assisted treatment, how much does the system support uh, uh, that on top of it? Um, and that the bundling project essentially built off on that. The next project really was combining that and looking at that for optimizing HIV care among people with substance use disorders because opioid patients who have HIV also share needles, and that can be a huge problem as well. Uh, uh, we have two new studies in this regard that, that are focused around either trying to predict laps or trying to do family focus versus drinker focus, smart phone interventions to see which ones are more effective. I want to talk more about the kind of line of research that's led to the first of these two new projects, which is myself and John Curtin as co-investigators, trying to build a system that's sensor-based, looking at how people use smart devices and systems. So again, as I said, alcohol use disorder, huge problem, lifetime prevalence, 29% of adults 18 plus in the US, massive consequences in terms of injuries and violence, hugely costly, third leading cause of preventable death, and relapse is common, really hard. 50% of people return to problem drinking within one year of treatment. It's very hard to get people to stop. The system we developed that I just showed you, when we tested it in a clinical trial, we in fact showed a reduction in the number of risky drinking days, literally having the number of risky drinking days. We did the same in terms of, again, analysis of completed cases only versus all available data. Again, highly significant differences. Also looking at prevalence, prevalence odds of maintaining abstinence at eight months, at 12 months, and overall. And in fact, again, found differences significantly in all three of treatment versus control. So the system overall is effective. We know that. The question becomes, these people are using the system over sometimes a six month, a 12 month period. Yes, it's effective, but within it, can we do any kind of relapse prediction? Can we understand by really thinking and thinking carefully about the benefits of online communication environments and thinking about how they can extend beyond just providing support and saying, can we use the data passively 
as users interact with the system to reveal when someone might be at a higher risk for relapsing? And can we do this to allow predictive modeling and intervention? So can we literally use that smart device as a way of sensing among people who are saying, look, I'm worried about my sobriety. I want your help. I want to use your app and I want you to track what I'm doing. And if you think I'm at risk, I want you to intervene. If I can have a group of users like that and they provide me information and it's fully transparent and they're doing it because they're willing to share that highly personal and private information with me because they're trying to stay sober, can we use the smartphone as a giant sensor and collector of data? And this would allow tailoring of services to intervene prior to relapse, right? So I could think about content appropriate for stable or unstable re recovery trajectories. If someone's having trouble, do I connect them with a friend? Do I urge a friend to reach out to them? Do I send them a particular message that's encouraging? Do I urge them to listen to a particular podcast? What do I do? What proves to be most effective? Or do I have a counselor contact them? Do I intervene for those people at highest risk? And how do I do it? One of the key tools we've used to try to understand what's happening within use of our system is natural language processing. There's a robust body of work that uses language as a lens through which to understand psychological processes, relevant to health and behavior. A lot of this stems from Jamie Pennebaker's work. Jamie Pennebaker is the developer of a system called Luke. But more importantly, Jamie, Jamie Pennebaker is an important theorist of the idea of the idea that our own writing, our own expression is deeply revealing about our psychological processes and states. And even goes further to suggest that things like diary writing self-reflective writing can be highly therapeutic. And this is something that we've grown quite interested in at Wisconsin, the idea of what I would broadly term expression effects. The idea that the effects of communication are oftentimes greater, not from the messages we receive, but rather from our producing messages, our posting on social media and saying we like something, our posting uh, uh, our thoughts or sharing a message, a text message with a friend, saying, you know, our feelings, expressing our views, stating our urges, all of that can be deeply, deeply revealing. And automated coding has advantages relative to human coding in terms of efficiency, reliability, and I would dare to say things like sensitivity. We've coded for things like, are you using singular or plural pro pronouns? right? Are you talking about yourself? Are you connecting yourself to the group? Very hard sometimes for coders to pay attention to that to the degree of exactness that a machine can. We can also code for concept-derived language categories, and we need theory to drive that coding process. So we have coded, when we've coded for content categories we've developed, and we just are finishing a paper where we have seven different content categories of machine trained content based on about 6,000 hand coded categories of content and using this in relapse prediction. <laughs> the method we've often used looks like this. We use features of a system like Luke, which is linguistic inquiry word count, but we've also used hand coded content to build machine learning classifiers. And we use that to content code the discussion that are taking place within our system, the messages that are being exchanged uh, 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 between users. And then we have action log data. And so we know exactly when these messages were sent, when these messages, so we know when they were produced and they're time stamped. And we can look at, uh, days used or messages sent or all these different kinds of features from action log data in addition to the features of the language production. 
And, it, and then we have survey assessments. We have baseline survey assessments that get at all things in relation to their demographics and their prior drinking and their study site and relationship stability and self-efficacy and prior quit attempts. And then we have follow-up studies at four months, eight months, 12 months. And so we can track change over time and we can look at behavior during any set of intervals or if we want to, down to the day, down to the minute if we wanted, those, that degree of granularity is not particularly helpful. When we build models using this data and use language as the predictive factor rather than these baseline factors, right? All of these are the things that are supposed to really shape the likelihood of relapsing, right? <clears throat> when we use language characteristics, we can achieve just in terms of predictive accuracy, 81.7% accuracy in classifying relapse, accounting for about 45.1% of the variance in relapse prediction. The baseline characteristics and system use do not effectively predict relapse. Linguistic features account for almost all of this variance. What predicts it? Things like impulsivity and negativity, swearing, you're at increased risk. Is that impulse control? Is that anger? Is that frustration? What we know is that swearing language and the use of swear words is predictive of increased risk of relapse. And negative emotion words, you're in distressed state, you're experiencing negative emotions, you're likely to turning back to the use of alcohol or other drugs is going to be increased. And that's what we find. On the other hand, cognitive surfacing words, where you're reflecting, cognitive mechanism words, words that are really about thinking about I'm, I'm, I'm grateful or I'm aware or I've got reached a new insight or I've been thinking about, those reduce risk. Those predict reduce risk. On the other hand, inhibition words, talking about urges and feelings and saying that you're cognitively surfacing those impulses, that predicts increased risk. And then personal reflection, when you talk about achievement words, I've set a week sober, two weeks sober, when you talk about days that you've maintained your sobriety and other people congratulate and support that achievement, that reduces risk. Also interestingly, death words reduce the likelihood of risk as people tell and share stories of people in their lives who they've lost to overdosing or to alcohol abuse. It's fascinating to look at how powerful language is as a lens through which to understand. When you just look at what people are saying as they communicate with each other in social forms. We've also, as I said, built machine learning classifiers to code things like recovery problems. When are people experiencing difficulties that we might want to flag automatically in the system so that we can actively be tracking when someone has expressed, oh my gosh, I'm really having some difficulty with this. Uh, uh, they're saying some feeling words. Or are those feeling words like time related or are they anger words? If they're anger words, oh, that might be more important. And so we've built things like support vector machines or decision trees or boosted decision trees to build more and more and more accurate classifiers to get at when is someone likely to experience a recovery problem? I've been feeling not myself for the past week. That kind of utterance would ultimately be through this process coded as something that's indicative of a recovery problem. I'm feeling okay, not recovery problem, right? God is good, not recovery problem. So we start to build classifiers to understand how actual utterances can be coded into our system using, again, decision trees or boosted decision trees as ways of essentially at every intersection making a dichotomous choice between true and false between options. When we've done this approach, sensitivity 88%, specificity 82%, this is used to flag messages on a daily basis for real-time recovery support. So we're getting closer to that ability. What are we gonna add next? Things like voice stress markers. We're having people 
who volunteer to do video check-ins every morning when they're using our system. We're going to use that to go, how do they, how do they sound? Is their voice level stressed? Is their facial expression expressing unhappiness or happiness? We're going to have ecological momentary assessment check-ins. We've done sometimes as often as four times a day or done them as triggered by people's interactions with new individuals. What does that mean? Those are contextualized text and call logs. If you text someone three times and you haven't put that person in as a contact, we do an ecological momentary assessment and say, who is this person? Is this family member, a friend? Is this an acquaintance? Is this someone who supports your recovery or someone who might threaten your recovery? Right. And so we get some basic information on who that is. So the next time a text message is exchanged, we know, is that likely something we should code as supportive or not supportive for your recovery? Same thing with call logs. You call someone three times, we send you a little quiz. Who is this person you called? Is this person a regular contact? You've called them three times now. There's been three messages back and forth. Oh, no, I'm just checking on my iPhone repair. It's nothing. Okay. We don't need to code that. No, it's, it's a new friend I met in recovery and we're trying to stay sober together and seems like a really good person. Okay. Do you think they support your recovery or do you think they're also a challenge because they're in recovery? So you do a little quiz. We can also do GPS tracking as signal for machine learning, right? So we can, all of this can be fed into machine learning. So GPS tracking lets us do things like the following. We can red box locations that are problematic. If there's a bar you used to drink at, if there's a park you used to go to to get drugs, if there was a house you used to visit to, to purchase the opioids, you can red box that and say, that's a dangerous place for me. If you get near that place, we can play a message to you, a message you've recorded yourself, a message a family member has recorded that encourages you to stay sober. We can also track GPS where we say, if you visited a place three times, we can send you another one of those ecological momentary assessments where you need to explain, who is this? What's this location? Is it a restaurant you're starting to go to? Is it a private residence? Again, is this a place that supports your sobriety or not? Ultimately, our goal is lapse prediction. What features can be signal of lapse prediction? What they say certainly can. Who they talk to is very likely to be. Where they go, we're starting to see strong evidence of. Who they spend time with, and we think their daily mood. That's the one we have the least evidence on right now. So it's the content of their test messages, the network of their communication partners, their geolocation and Bluetooth tags, and their video check-ins. And using this, can we predict daily risk likelihood and then figure out how to intervene? And this is the piece that we've published already that is essentially our protocol for our personal sensing study, explaining how we're collecting this information from 200 and, uh, 480 Americans right now, we've impaneled about a quarter of those people. We're in the process of trying to impanel all of those people and it'll be on a continuing basis. Um, this project really is, again, trying to predict daily lap lapse risk by using degree of engagement with treatment, exposure to use-related cues and surroundings, and changes in wellness, including stress, cravings, and mood is what we're gonna be focused on here. So people are at lower risk when they're attended to and supported, and we're gonna make sure that that happens. We're gonna give them medication assisted treatment. All of this is gonna be beyond that. And when people are, at, uh, 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 people are at higher risk, when they see people or visit places associated with past use, experience pain or life stressors, or have strong craving, we're gonna be tracking all of that constantly too. Essentially, this becomes a massive basis for personal sensing. So we're able to look within and leverage two kinds of use of information, stuff from smartphones, but also wearable devices. There's social media use. The latest iteration of this that we've built, we have a system by which they can provide us access to their social media content if they want to. We can also have them not only provide information from their smartphones, but also from the browser they use on their computer. All of this information can be collected longitudinally. 
So it's people in their naturalist environments doing the behavior and social interactions, expressing the thoughts, emotions, moods that they're having in real time that we're trying to capture. And we can do this actively by having people take actions that require measurement, including self-report, like our ecological momentary assessments. But more and more of this becomes passive as we do some active collection. Once I collect the information on the person that you've texted with or called, once I have that, I'm not going to ask it to you every time you contact that person. That becomes information that just exists in the background. That becomes passive measurement. <coughs> so we have a great deal we can collect. Ecological momentary assessment, geolocation, phone and text logs, content of people's text messages, how long and in which ways they're using text features like motivation, commitment, engagement. All of that becomes signal that we can feed into our ability to predict the likelihood of relapse. Now, again, most of this is theory driven. It's driven by theories of social networks. It's driven by theories of of uh, uh, expression effects and the, sur the surfacing of psychological states. So we're using theory to develop our machine learning algorithms and really focus our attention on those pieces of signal that we think have the greatest potential. Some of this is about deriving rat lapse risk prediction. So we're trying to you know, get the frequency, timing, and duration of geolocation or contacts logs all of this can be enhanced with providing that contextual information that is so essential. So just collecting information via the phones without having that contextual information really limits the potential, right? The contextual information is important to really understand the people and places, and it can be collected with relatively little burden because once you have that relatively small, stable group of frequent social contacts and frequent places visited, over the six, eight months, most of that gets collected in the first four weeks. After that, we are creatures of habit. We visit the same restaurants. We see the same friends. We hang out in the same places. You don't need to keep asking. All of this can be collected passively. And then ultimately it can be used to model lapse risks. So we can use this to predict a whole host of outcomes. And then we can also use this, we're increasingly adopting machine learning approaches where we're, we have features, predictors derived from actively and passively collected data, trying to build lapse prediction models that operate either on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, and then thinking best how to intervene. That is a, 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 a huge part of uh, uh, the research we've been doing around uh, addiction treatment. We have a whole other line of research around aging and healthy aging. What I want to talk about next is another project that we're now embarking on. And I don't know how much time I have. Do I have about 15, 20 minutes left? Or, or how, how long would you like me to go? Uh, uh, I, I think it, it's all right. It's like um, one hour for your talk and followed by a QA. and a if you Okay, like. so I'll, I'll, I can finish up in about 15 minutes. So I think we, we right. can get through this pretty quickly. So the second line of research that exploits these computational techniques is very different than the first. The very first, the first one is again, in some respects, very intimate. We're, we're impaneling people, we're tracking every single thing they're doing. These are people who are voluntarily providing their information, people who want us to, and literally the way we compensate them is by asking them which piece of information they wanna provide us. And for each piece of information or layer of data they're willing to provide, we compensate them like $10 a month. So they're fully aware of and are providing only the data they want. The studies I'm about to talk to you about, and specifically one set of studies, is looking at data that's publicly available and out there. It's social media data or news media data. And we're using computational tools to analyze the information that's out there. Much of this has been supported by grants, but frankly could be done much more cheaply. The first set of projects we need these massive federal grants. We have to impanel people. We have to track them over time. Many times we have to give them technology. Each study participant sometimes costs between five and $10,000 to conduct the study with them, right? I mean, it's that expensive. The studies I'm about to talk to you about sometimes are studies of 10 million people. And they're very cheap to collect, on the other hand, because you're really collecting available social media data 
that can be collected via using different tools. So when we were looking before, we we're looking at small social networks for health support. There we need to establish trust among users, deeper, longer ties that require time to form. And it's ideal for social support and social capital. And that's what we're tracking and looking at. What we're switching to talking about is large social networks as a public sphere. The network of networks and how many people are connected into large online communities. The constant activity, expression, and contention that occurs in that huge online public square. And I'm not saying that it's necessary deliberative because I'm not convinced it's deliberative. And this allows attention to both micro and macro dynamics that are happening in those large networks. The case study I wanna to talk to you about is another huge problem in the United States. And we have no shortage of problems, whether it's overconsumption of alcohol or the opioid epidemic, the other epidemic we have is an epidemic of mass shootings um, and mass violence with guns. And this is just showing you, starting in 1982, some of the most violent mass shootings that have occurred, when the 10 deadliest have occurred, and how the 10 deadliest have occurred mainly in the last decade and a half. And how the volume of, uh, 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 you know, uh, the number of people injured, the degree and the volume of violence has magnified tremendously. What is the public response to mass shootings? Well, here reporting in response to violence, you know, uh, 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 and the outpouring of grief is, con is followed by contestation over gun policy. So when there's initial information about mass violence, what do we see from Americans? thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. They offer these very nice little social media posts, but they don't really mean anything. But in the period that follows mass violence, there is then cost contestation and debate over gun policy. And we wanted to look at mass shootings as a window into the nature of mourning in response to mass tragedies. So whose lives are worth mourning? When certain kinds of people die, do, do Americans express more concern or less? How many victims have to be killed or injured for Americans to even notice, given how prevalent violence is? Do we grieve more for children? Do we grieve more for people of particular races in a country that is defined by racial divisions? So we we test the possibility of deliberation on issues of public interest as well. Do we see evidence of, of discursive public sphere where people are talking to each other or more of a polarized public sphere where, where there's really no discussion going on, but rather two parallel kind of oppositional viewpoints? Does the race of the victims or the shooter shape policy discourses? Again, do we care more about acting, not just expressing concern, but actually acting when the racial characteristics of the victims and the shooters differ? And what spurs discourse on gun rights and gun control? So to do this, we have developed a massive data set. This has taken us years to develop. We are just in the process now of analyzing this top portion of the data set. We have just started that. But this is the part of the data set I wanna to talk to you about, which is from 2012 to 2014, so over a three year period, all of 2012, all of 2013, all of 2014, we coded every mass shooting event that occurred in the United States. This is any mass shooting we defined as by the FBI definition of mass killing, which is four or more people killed in one instance, not including the shooter. So four or more people killed by a single assailant. And that if this was done using a, 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 a handgun or a rifle or a, a, a weapon of that sort, we coded it as a mass shooting and a mass killing in that respect. We did detailed event coding of 
the victims, the nature of the victims, the age of the victims, the gender of the victims, the, the race of the victims, the perpetrators, the kind of weapon they used, their relationship with the people that they shot, their uh, 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 racial characteristics, their motivation for their action, the location in which the violence took place, school setting, public setting, workplace, public, private home, and the kind of weapon that was used. This was microcoded for the 63 events that occurred that met our criteria during this period of time. We also, for that same period of time, used daily scoring via machine learning and hashtag clustering. So we used two techniques. One was we trained and built a machine learning classifier. Secondly, we used key hashtags that we could easily and quickly cluster around themes of thoughts and prayers, expressions of sympathy, gun control, all the language used to talk about gun control, and gun rights, which was the advocating for the maintenance of Second Amendment rights. All of this was drawn from an archive that we've maintained at the UW. Starting in 2012, we began collecting 10% of global Twitter. We have been collecting 10% of global Twitter for from 2012 through 2015, at which point Twitter cut us off because they commercialized our product, at which point we have been collecting 1% access to global Twitter and then since then, we've gotten different commercial media, social listening platforms like Synthesio and Infigy Atlas and other tools to monitor social media and news media. And then we've also used tools like Media Cloud, uh, Factiva, Nexus, Lexus, um, both, again, through our library system and other tools to, to pull news discourse as well. So this was, again daily mentions of relevant biograms in terms of mass shootings, gun control, or gun rights. This was, again, a data set, you know, just to produce the machine learning, just to do the biogram analysis of the massive number of news sources we considered, and to do this event coding. This we're now combining with the daily value of different stock gun stocks, weekly gun sales, which we receive through a Freedom of Information Act request as required by national instant criminal background checks in the United States. And then detailed coding of almost 3,400 bills proposed across all 50 states regarding gun laws. So this is ultimately where we're analyzing next, but I wanna share with you what we found regarding these relationships. So again, method was to look at these mass shooting features over 60 events across those three years and, and a number of dates, certain events overlapped. We reduced the number by three. This included very, very widely covered shootings in Aurora Theater shooting, the Sandy Hook school shooting, and both two military shootings at the Navy Yard and at Fort Hood. For each one, we coded again, the total number of victims, the number of children killed, the number of African-Americans killed, the race of the shooter and the shooting type whether a public shooting or school shooting. We included other factors as well, but these are the ones I'm gonna focus on here. And then we looked at Twitter discourse of mass shootings during that same period. Again, 10% random sample. Keywords for the data poll included gun, shooter, shooting, firearm. Produced initially 75 million tweets. We cleaned that down to 4.8 million and classified 1.6 million. Why? Because when we went in and looked at 75.2 million, a lot of coverage of shooter and shooting was about basketball and hockey. A lot of it was about military events happening all over the world. So a lot of cleaning and data cleaning is and always is required and something you should always dedicate time to. Ultimately, we landed on three discourses, thoughts and prayers, gun policy, and support for the Second Amendment. Gun policy was really uh, support for making changes to gun policy or gun control. Second Amendment was really uh, 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 maintenance of maintenance of gun rights. We ultimately built this again using both machine learning text classification and hashtag clustering. The method again, 
We also did the same work for news attention to mass shootings during the same period. This was based on RSS feeds of all news stories from six major news outlets. For the progressive news outlets, we had the New York Times and the Washington Post. For moderate, CNN and the Chicago Tribune. For conservative, the New York Post and Fox News. Here we looked at gun violence. We looked at mass shooting and gun violence for uh, 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 Second Amendment and gun rights and NRA for gun rights and for gun control, uh, gun control, gun laws and background checks. The degree to which Twitter volume coincides with key mass shooting events is just visible when you just look at the overtime variation in the discussion of gun rights, gun control, and thoughts and prayers. What's fascinating is this period right here of discussion of gun control, and that happened specifically because the U.S. Senate was considering gun control measures in the wake of the Newtown shooting where so many children died, and it didn't pass. In the meantime, this big eruption of discussion of gun rights is a concerted effort by gun rights advocates to maintain gun rights in, a, in New Jersey, which was considering restricting gun rights. There was a huge online campaign and effort. All of these other little punctuated moments that you're seeing here, in addition to these major moments like the Aurora Theater shooting, the Newtown School shooting, the Navy Yard shooting, and the Fort Hood shooting, are other mass shooting events. When we look at news volume, we see the same pattern. And curiously, if you look at this, when you look across the different news sources and across the various discourses, and at the top, what you see is more liberal, more moderate and conservative news sources covering gun violence, then gun control, and then gun rights, again, stacked. What you see is, again, gun violence is covered most ephemerally. Gun control, again, you see sparked in attention specifically around the period where the U.S. Senate is considering legislation in addition to those other peaks. And, and then uh, uh, progressive and moderate and conservative sources talking about gun rights often at that same time. But here's what's fascinating. When we do ARIMA modeling of the overtime relationships, thoughts and prayers is ephemeral. The half-life is a day. We offer our thoughts and prayers. A day later, America forgets. The thoughts and prayers are literally something that has little to no lasting value. Gun control discourse is interesting in that it almost is periodic. It experiences these little anniversaries where it peaks on the day and then it kind of comes back a week later and two weeks later and three weeks later. And it kind of does this over a period of time. But it lasts, but not as well. Gun rights discourse is astoundingly resilient. It peaks and it just stays strong across the entire. Anytime we do a REMA modeling, we're looking at how long something explains itself. Gun rights discourse is self-perpetuating. We were so concerned about this, we thought this might be bots. We actually did a separate bot analysis to pull bots out didn't change the relationship at all. It is the degree of animated, political, polarized support around gun rights in the United States. This is true whether we did it based on the machine learning or based on the hashtag counts, absolutely parallel results. And when we look at the actual time series regressions, trying to understand what explains thoughts and prayers, what explains gun control discourse, what explains gun rights discourse on Twitter, what explains gun violence attention or what we call the gun policy difference in news media coverage? So attention to gun violence in news media coverage, because news media coverage always tends to try to be politically balanced. We said what throws media coverage out of balance? What makes them stress an emphasis on gun policy, changing gun policy over the maintenance of gun rights? So we kind of combine those two measures. We did that again for progressive, moderate, and conservative sources. So what you see across the top here is thoughts and prayers on Twitter, gun control on Twitter, gun rights on Twitter, just overall gun violence news coverage, gun policy difference in progressive media, gun policy difference in moderate media, gun policy difference in conservative media. 
gun policy difference always positive means greater emphasis on gun control over gun rights. The number of victims is one of the key drivers of thoughts and prayers, but also of discourse around gun control, gun rights on Twitter, but also overall news coverage of gun violence, and only within progressive media, greater emphasis on gun, uh, 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 gun control. Number of children parallels that entirely. So number of victims or, and as well as number of children killed are major drivers of thoughts and prayers, gun control, gun rights on Twitter, as well as overall gun violence coverage in, across those news media and attention to gun control over gun rights in progressive media. The loss of African-American lives is the opposite. When African-American lives are lost, there's less thoughts and prayers on social media. There's fewer calls for gun control. There's less discussion of gun rights. And there's less overall news media attention to gun violence when it's the loss of African-American lives. And even more troubling, when the race of the shooter is white, there is less attention. There's less thoughts and prayers. There's less talk about gun control. There's less talk about gun rights. And there's less attention to gun violence in major news media. When the shooter is non-white, there's more of each of those things. We see some small effects in terms of thoughts and prayers when it's a public shooting, and actually a negative relationship when it's a school shooting once all these other factors are taken into account. So the thought that a lot of this is triggered by school shootings, no. If it's public, if it involves kids, those are the factors more so than the location per se. What do we see? Asymmetric nature of polarized gun policy dis discourse, right? Really explains the resistance to gun policy change. Gun rights is extraordinarily resilient and explained by very little. Gun rights discourse, especially in right-wing media, but certainly uh, also on social media, is extraordinarily res resilient. In addition to that, not, not all rights are equally cherished. The volume of violence and the death of children matter more. The loss of black lives matters less for news and for social. And not all attackers generate the same outrage. White shooters least lead to less social and news attention than non-white shooters. And they also, you know, the other question is, which we haven't answered yet, is do they spur more discourse about mental illness, which is one of our suspicions. School shootings spur policy news in conservative media I'll point that out. This is the one place where we see conservative media talking more about the need for some kind of gun policy. And typically what this discourse is, is a discussion about, we need to harden schools. We need to arm teachers. It's the right using gun violence in schools as an argument for another place to have more guns. Now, the one additional question I want to leave you with is what about the broader media system? How do news and social influence one another? Here so far, we looked at how different ground truth factors about the nature of mass shootings influence both news and social media coverage. The real bigger question to me is, is there top-down influence? Does news still shape social media responses, kind of agenda setting and framing effects of elites? Or is it bottom-up influence now? Does social media drive news content? Is connective action a driver of news? Here's what we ultimately find. We've just published this piece in International Journal of Communication. Um, I'm sorry, actually, I think it's International Journal of Press Politics. <laughs> this is what we term a reactive media system. In terms of gun violence news, it is the prime driver. It drives general gun policy difference in moderate political news media. It also has a relationship with general thoughts and prayers discourse on Twitter. It's the prime agent that moves a lot of initial content. What's fascinating is thoughts and prayers content on Twitter also subsequently drives 
gun violence news, meaning these are in a tightly bound interconnected system. The more people express thoughts and prayers and outrage, the more likely news media is to continue to cover that particular episode of mass violence. What's also interesting is thoughts and prayers triggers discussion about gun control. Discussion about gun control triggers discussion about protecting gun rights. The right is reactive to left-wing discourses. The right is paying attention to the left and responding against it. Gun violence news, thoughts and prayers both trigger discourse about gun control. In addition, gun control discourse on, on Twitter, in addition to general uh, uh, moderate uh, uh, media discourse, triggers discourse in progressive media about gun policy. Let's control more. So gun control discourse on Twitter drives gun policy discourse and news more than the other way around. Moderate discourse and news drives and emboldens progressive media to talk about it more. Again, progressive media's attention drives greater attention among conservative media. Conservative media is paying attention not just to progressive media, to overall gun violence coverage and to gun policy difference coverage in moderate media, reacting to all of it. Conservative media in this and, and social media and conservative media content in this content is reactive. What do we see? Something that's bottom up and asymmetric. After accounting for, and this, this modeling takes into account all of those and exogenous event features. We're taking into account those 63 mass shooting events when looking at this system of equations. Sympathy and gun control discourses on Twitter precede news framing of gun rights, gun control debate more than the other way around. Sustained social discourses seem to drive news media content. In addition, conservatives on Twitter and conservative media react to progressives on Twitter without their progressive counterpoints exhibiting a similar response. Are they monitoring and countering? Why isn't the left monitoring the right in the same way and responding against it while the right responds against the, the, the left? That we think is very interesting and curious. I'll end with the following thought, and I think I've taken my full hour. Um, really, I think in addition to the theoretical insights we can gain by looking at small and large networks, looking at detailed interactions, looking at interactions at scale, is these amazing opportunities we have to look at this question of, let's call it big data, in the digital world, right? Many available insights come from close analysis of system logs and machine learning of posts. We can look really closely at these kinds of digital traces that are left behind with social and mobile devices. We can also do, even when we don't have that kind of detailed consent that allows for that kind of analysis, through data aggregation, we do not violate the privacy of anybody in the research I just showed you. All of the data is vastly aggregated. We're looking at things at the systemic level. We're looking at relations between broad discourses on social media and news media coverage patterns. Right. And so, again, in both cases, we're trying to be very respectful of those data privacy issues. But I think we can find ways around that doing this kind of research. I'll also mention this is all about the science of team science. I don't do this research alone. I do this with many other people. Again, I've been doing computational social science research for a long time, starting in graduate school at Minnesota with David Fan, doing computer aided content analysis and public opinion modeling. The most recent work towards this has really been a lot of the work with chess that we've been doing for quite some time. People like Ray Pingree, Brett Shaw at Wisconsin, but then also people like Joe Capella and Russ Newman, who really pushed me to think about these issues in different ways. And then so many collaborators at Wisconsin, uh, so many former students like Rachel Cornfield, current colleagues like uh, Catalina Toma, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, jo you know Dave Gustafson, who I cannot emphasize enough. Uh, who's, you know, I've done so much work with, John Curtin, uh, and then many of my former students like Joe Lukito, Yinni Zhang, uh, 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 Ji Yoon Suk, many others who've been involved in this. So it's not just me. I don't mean to suggest that this research is mine. It's in fact, many, many people. Uh, here's my contact information. If you want to reach out to me after the talk, I'm happy uh, to take questions. Um, and we can turn this hopefully into a discussion. So I think I took my full hour. Hopefully have 
uh, I generated some questions and, and we can have a nice conversation to follow this. So I'll take, I'll relinquish the screen so I can see people's faces. Hopefully everyone has had a chance to jot down any contact information they would like. And I'm happy to respond over Twitter or over email. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the really enlightening talk. Uh, very impressive and very fascinating studies. So uh, the content so rich. So now uh, let's leave the floor open. Uh, you can open your camera to ask the questions or you can type down your questions in the chat box. The first question is always the toughest. Who dares to ask the first question? Doug, so may I ask the yeah, question? Please. Yeah, yeah, please yeah. go ahead, Zoe. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Sun. Thanks for the talk, Professor. Uh, actually, my question is about the uh, detail, details about the second project you introduced. And I'm wondering how did you choose the, uh, the uh, first, the co coding, the coding you choose to code the race, actually. And uh, why do you choose it? Uh, why do you choose it? And actually, I heard you said uh, you actually code the gun type. Uh, maybe you didn't use the gun type here, but you choose to code it. Uh, why do you choose to code these uh, things? And second, uh, why why do you, how do you choose to use the hashtag? You use uh, three type for this prayer and, sh and and thoughts. Yes, I'm wondering how do you choose it because I read your study just now and you didn't specific said why do you choose them. But I think it's very important. It's uh, it's because you choose it and you can uh, analyze it afterwards. Yes, thank Absolutely. you. No, I think that's the, I think you've hit on two important questions there. The question of why we chose both the categories we chose for machine learning and the categories that we chose for the hashtag clustering was really driven by the volume of the content around mass shooting events and the three different dominant topics that were discussed. The most dominant in the immediate wake was the thoughts and prayers, these expressions of sympathy. And sometimes they would take on a local flavor and say, thoughts for Newtown, thoughts and prayers for the children, thoughts and prayers for the family. So we noticed this pattern and that's something, again, a lot of this begins with a very grounded analysis of the social media or news media content, looking closely to understand what's there. The same thing, frankly, we probably went in with more of an, an appetite and an interest in looking for the polarized discourses around gun control and gun rights, because that's a long standing political debate in the United States. The other thing is it lent itself to hashtag clustering because Political debates tend to want to use hashtags as a way to draw and maintain attention, a way to show their connection to other groups and, and essentially to create an online pattern of belonging and connection. And so looking at hashtags, we could also see that these discourses were reflected in ways we could cause using machine learning. So those categories were really developed using a kind of almost inductive approach of looking at what the content was, but again, also driven by our theoretical concerns on polarization and the question of what is the nature of this discourse? Is there equivalent discourse on both sides? Or is one side really outpacing the other? Are they responding to the same features and factors? No, it appears not, right? So that was what was underlying it. Um, I've kind of forgotten your second question. I think it was dealing with why we chose race and race, it was really the factor was twofold. One was to develop our initial database of the, the mass shooting events. We first went and looked at existing databases of mass shooting events. And what we found was we had also gone and requested data directly from the FBI, where we looked at any mass shooting event that met the FBI criteria. What was incredibly curious was there was a subcategory of types of violence that were coded as gang-related or drug-related that met all the other criteria of a mass shooting, but seemingly if they involved a large number of Black people, they were coded that way and not considered mass shootings by things like the Stanford Mass Shooting Database. So we started with the Stanford Mass Shooting Database, but we really relied on the FBI database to generate all our questions. When we notice this pattern of many databases like the Stanford database, not including these 
episodes that met every criteria for mass violence and mass shooting, but the only reason they were not included was because they seemed to involve a large volume of Black people. We said, we need to pay attention to race. And so we made that a factor in terms of looking at an additional factor, and it turned out to be a hugely important factor. I don't know if that answers the question. I hope it does. Is that, is that address yeah. the two questions you had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'd like to go ahead. So, um, Professor Sean, it's really um, our honor to um, have this fantastic talk. And actually, I um, am the associate professor in the Department um, of Communication here in Hong Kong. And I've um, done a number of studies related to just in time adaptive intervention. Um, so it's very um, connected, relevant to your first part of talk, uh, designing data uh, for um, alcohol and relapse prevention. So I'm doing a lot of work on smoking cessation. And oh, I'd love to see it. Please send me some of it over email. I'd love to see it. Sure. Yeah. So I think um, I have two questions related to that um, topic or research area. Um, because um, I, I see the HS is, is definitely like a well-known and well-studied condition. Um, but I think in the design process, um, there must be a lot of uh, collaboration with tech companies who help you design or like um, like uh, make your ideas come true, right? <laughs> to, yes. to implement, to implement yeah. those ideas. So can you share some of your experience working with um, tech companies or like how to like uh, realize your, your thoughts into um, reality? And the second question is about the uh, refusal rate or the um, actually uh, perhaps um, like how long like, the ability that you can keep participants engaging in this kind of intervention, because for EMA, um, the Ecological Monetary Assessments, um, it requires a lot of work and time from participants. And sometimes you may pay a lot compared to other types of methods. Um, and the retention rate is relatively low. So yep. do you have any methods to encourage engagement? Um, so I will, I, I will say in both cases, I will, um, I will, Really admit I'm very spoiled. And what do I mean by that? On the one hand, um, most of my work that we have done around uh, looking closely at digital trace data within health support systems has been using the CHESS system. And the CHESS system has built and developed at UW-Madison. So we house the system in terms of the server side of the system on servers at the UW. It's maintained by the chess center. The people who are the programmers and creators of that system are people I meet with weekly or bi-weekly, right? And so it becomes part of a synergistic process where you're discussing things that you might wanna develop. Programmers, developers are saying that's feasible, that's not feasible, we can do this. We could, it would take six months to do that, it'll take two months to do that. And you talk about both feasibility and part of the grants that you get lay out certain projects and ideas you wanna do and frankly, the reason I think chess has been very successful, and I mentioned the large volume of, of grants that chess has received as a center, what that has done is not built one system, then built another system, and then built the third system. Instead, it's taken the basic chess system and continued to refine and develop it in ways that have made it go from a computer-based system to a tablet and laptop-based system to a mobile device-based system to a system that can work across Android and Apple phones to a system that has more passive background data collection. So it's the, the capabilities have been built into the system over time. And that's been done because we, we collaborate and work very closely with the developers. They're tr a trusted part of the team. And I'll point out, if I would go back to the slides, you'd see many of the developers are co-authors on those papers. So we, it's not just a, a, it's not window dressing. It's not, oh, your staff and, 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 and thank you for, we'll pay your salary and go about your business. No, we, we treat them as collaborators because they frankly are very deeply involved. If we think about everything from the idea of media affordances and, 
creating technology and, and, and the way that they can create usable data for us to do computational analysis, oftentimes even building detection systems into the back end of software. It's all a critical part of the collaboration. <laughs> so that part has really spoiled me. And so I have not had to have that kind of try to make inroads into tech companies. I think that's a really challenging thing to do. And it takes a great deal of trust to develop that kind of relationship. So I, I, I will freely admit being spoiled. And the second part, I'm also spoiled because within chess, we also have a large data apparatus. So we have program and project managers who are very expert at reaching out to research subjects when they're not responsive. If we don't see activity, we also collect data, not just on those primary respondents, but they have to, if we give them a smart device, a cell phone, they have to provide us three other people that are points of contact for them. <coughs> and so if, if they become unreachable, we reach out to these other individuals. And we, we do a very good job of following up a lot of recontact, a lot of following up with uh, allied individuals. It is rates of recontact and rates of fall off are no joke. It, we've probably maintained in most studies about, I'd say 70 to 75% through study at 12 months, which is pretty extraordinary, but that's when we, you know, that's less true in addiction treatment studies, probably closer to 50%. Uh, and that's why we always report data on here's the data that's available. Here's the data on the people who completed the full study, right? So we can develop lapse prediction models, sometimes with people who are with us for two months. That's relevant data. They may fall off and what we are, our final data from them is lack of sobriety, right? And so we use the data in lots of different ways the question ultimately becomes, you know, ideally, yeah, we want to keep people on study a long time. And we have staff who we compensate quite well, who are very expert at doing that. And we, and we don't outsource this. Rather, we've, we've really invested in good people who are part of the chess team. And chess right now, I think, employs 45 or 50 people as a center. And that's mainly funded off of these bid federal grants. So when we get these big grants that are, you know, 5 million, 3 million, 8 million, 10 million sometimes, most of that is going towards paying and recruiting subjects, providing big incentives to keep them on study and not be coercive, but to really encourage it. And then paying project managers and recruiting specialists to really maintain those that data quality, right? Because the data is only as good as that we can really maintain those strong connections with those people and build the trust and collect the data over time. So we work hard at it, but I think you're hitting on a huge set of concerns, which is, yeah, absolutely, a lot of data loss and a lot of projects. And it really makes me question a lot of conclusions that get drawn if you don't, if you can't maintain high quality data throughput. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Definitely. Thank you for, for sharing. This is very valuable. And I think that's emphasized the importance of collaboration and working as a team and working with people from different disciplines. I, I can't emphasize that enough either. And, and truth be told, I think more than anything else, the lesson I've learned is that, you know, in the problems we face, especially when we're studying technology, especially in communication settings, no one of us can do this work on our own anymore. I think we have to be collaborative. It's the problems are too complex. They're oftentimes require specialization expertise that cross disciplinary domains, cross methodological specializations. And frankly, my students are in many ways much more sophisticated about computational analysis than I am. I'm very good conceptually. I can help them think about things, but many of them are way more expert on some of the most innovative methods. And that's, again, part of establishing those collaborations. We have to rely on each other to both think about research projects, imagine getting research resources, but also being effective about those latest research methods and having those great collaborators who are great at data collection, who are great at development, right? Who are great at building technology. So it's, it's, it's also people in the medical field, also engineers and computer scientists. So the teams we build are very large and very diverse. So we have actually a question in the chat box. Okay, 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 sure. Sure, let me look at that. Um, uh, my question is about the work on public response to shootings. Is there any chance that 
if more lags are introduced in the VR model, we can possibly take a look at how the effects evolve with time. So uh, I will tell you that in our in our vector auto regressions, we always test multiple lags, and we try to look at the kind of optimal lag length. So that's typically reported in these papers or in the appendices of the papers. And yes, we have looked at different lengths to understand, uh, um, you know, how these factors may evolve differently. Um, and I don't want to get into the the weeds about that, but in fact, the question of both if we set up different lags, do we see different patterns of cross influence? Occasionally, though, one thing I will say is, especially with gun rights discourse on the political right, especially on Twitter, very little explains it. So even when we showed you that final model, the one thing they seem to respond to is Twitter content on the left. But even if you look at ground truth factors, most ground truth factors were not playing a big role on Twitter on the right besides the volume of mass shootings, things like that. And so it's, to me, a very kind of, even when we test these different lags, given the robustness of the volume of that far right discourse, it's very unshakable, right? So that's one thing that we feel very confident about. The other thing I will say is we've run Praise Winston, but we've also, because of the approach of using vector autoregression, tried to test the robustness and the lag difference for our our uh, 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 ground truth variables, some of those factors, and in fact found that most of our results are quite resi resilient, either when measured uh, uh, simultaneously, one day lag, or two or even three day lags. So we've tested a lot of these, tried to do a robust assess. The person we work with most closely is John PV House. And John PV House is a professor of political science, he's actually chair of our political science department at Wisconsin but he's also someone who literally wrote the textbook on time series modeling. And so whenever we run our models, he always runs a whole host of separate models for us, partly because he's very concerned with robustness testing and very concerned with looking at and optimizing lags. And so that's just been a feature of this. Now, one of the papers that we wrote that actually describes how to apply some of these processes in communications is a piece led by Chris Wells called The Temporal Turn in Communication. And it was published in the International Journal of Communication. Um, you can find that on my website as well if you wanted to look there. Um, it would be under the computational part of the research um, and you could download it there or you could probably find it on my Google Scholar too. But Chris Wells is the lead author on that piece. And it really lays out these different time series analysis methods and specifically working through the layers, testing lags, using VAR, using impulse response functions, the whole range of techniques. Um, and again, we did that really working closely with John to say, here's how we can really teach people in communication how to use the most cutting edge, you know, uh, uh, time series modeling techniques from political science and econometrics. Very helpful, yeah. So um, I just heard a voice, uh, is there any question? Yeah. Hi, uh, Celine, if I may ask, Arjun. Oh, sure. Adrian, yeah, sure. Hi, nice. Nice to see you. So thank you for that fascinating talk. I mean, it's very thought provoking. I have a couple of questions. I come yeah. from a journalistic background, so uh, and then I'm a PhD student here. So number one is your the gun rights, uh, the project that you did. How would you, as a researcher, this is my query because there are 50 states in the U.S. So did you notice that different states are responding differently? And would you take that into consideration and how would you address that? Because we have seen during the George Floyd case, America did not react homogeneously. So it is very different. Oh, absolutely not. I think that's a huge point. So in fact- I have, Sorry, if I may just button with the oh, second- oh, Go ahead, yes, please, please, please. Second question, which is uh, when, we, when, we, when we take our primary sources, for example, Twitter content, or from the social media space, there will be, a reaction that the social media will also have its own because I mean, to Twitter would react maybe differently to gun violence and gun rights in US than abortion or other religious issues. So how would you then depend on the Twitter content or social media content? I have two specific questions. That's it. So, um, so let me go back to the, the, the first question. And can you ask the first question again? Because I almost kind of half forgot it. How homogeneous is the, how do we take that into consideration? Because there are 50 states in the US. Sure. So, so react equally. So absolutely true. And I think one of the things, so 
for our, um, we do have geolocation on the 64, three events that we coded. Um, most of them are so high volume, they were covered in national media, but your point about local reactions, we're taking into account in two ways. One is for those 3,400 bills that we're coding, those are being coded at the state level. And our hypothesis is that in the wake of mass shootings, that red states with red legislatures will tend to actually relax gun laws. They will actually do things to make guns more available. Concealed carry, hardening schools, arming teachers, all of these kinds of measures we'll see more in red states. The other thing is we actually have measures based on our FOIA for weekly gun sales by state. So those weekly gun sales figures will be by state. So then we can start taking the data for the 63 events, which we do have geocoded, saying, is there a local surge in the states or the surrounding states and is that local surge at all dependent on those state gun laws, right? So thinking about the endogeneity question there of the laws versus the availability of guns and sales. So that's the next step in the process. The third element I'll say is we're thinking about, there's a, a new psychology professor at Wisconsin, assistant professor, who's looking specifically at gun culture in the American South and specifically the idea of tracing it actually to this desire to own guns and this psychological sense that you're protecting yourself from violence really coming from places where there's highly racialized uh, 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 patterns of behavior between whites and blacks that can be traced back even to the Civil War era, let alone the Civil Rights era. So deeply historical roots and cultural roots for psychological feelings of wanting to own guns and really tracing that to certain Southern places. So we're starting to incorporate that into our thinking as well. The thing is there a regional difference in some of these patterns. We have not tested any of that yet. That's kind of the next phase of the project, but frankly, that is, I think you're hitting on the exact the right question. And then your second question was about, again, can you repeat that one? How, how would you go, rely on Twitter content when it reacts differently to social issues like? Sure, sure, sure. So. Or, in addition to the work we've done on mass shootings, we've done parallel projects on the Me Too movement, looking at Me Too accusations and various kinds of Me Too revelations or big Me Too announcements like Time's Up or the Time magazine cover that named the, the, the silence breakers. We've also done the same thing for looking at immigration as a, as a topic and looking at things like Trump tweets, various kinds of uh, 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 judicial decisions, various kinds of release of unemployment facts and figures or immigration crossing facts and figures. So in all these cases, we try to use ground truth data and then look at through, again, through a lot of data cleaning, what is the signal we can find about the social media discourses that occur? So in the case of Me Too, for example, we found two major, well, there's more than two, but three major discourses, the two that we focused on, one was what we called networked acknowledgement. Networked acknowledgement was people sharing stories of their experiences of Me Too and other women or other men saying to them affirmatively, I believe you, I support you, this is horrible, we need to stop this, we need to work together to make, to create an end to this. The second discourse was more activist discourse, which was Me Too military, Me Too mosque, Me Too uh, church, Me Too, you know, uh, and naming particular colleges or high schools, really trying to say we need to interrogate these institutions through the lens of the Me Too movement, and we need an accounting, we need activism, we need legal change, formally asking for activism. We could link those to different features of ground truth events and we could link them to each other. So I think, yes, some events like mass shootings spur much more high volume content. Some like Me Too spur more or less depending on the nature of the event. But nonetheless, social media is a wonderful barometer. It's almost like a seismograph. It goes up and down. It's sensitive enough that you can sense these things if you build your machine learning algorithms or your hashtag detection system or just keyword detection systems in a way that really let you tune into what's happening in the real world 
and how is it reflected in social media? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we've already uh, overrun a bit. <laughs> uh, again, thanks so much, Devin, for the really fascinating talk. Uh, I'm sorry for <laughs> we're sorry for making your day so long, but we really no, learned so much. Very, very, very energizing and wonderful questions, and and happy to engage with you. This was really a pleasure. So happy to have joined you, and thank you for all joining so early in your day and so late in mine. So nice yeah. to see you all. Thank you so much for giving Bye. us a fascinating talk. Bye.